Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, and Alexis Smith in One More Tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I think you'll agree, at least I have found it so, that most successful dramas include one of three ingredients. The search for romance, the pursuit of a career, or the conflict of personal beliefs. Our play tonight, One More Tomorrow, happily combines all three which may be one reason why the Broadway version was such a hit and why it made such a successful motion picture. Another reason for its screen success is unquestionably tonight's three stars, Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, and Alexis Smith, who bring you Warner Brothers' entertaining and provocative screenplay. One More Tomorrow is particularly appropriate to this merry month of June, dealing as it does with problems of marriage and romance, a play I'm sure our June brides will especially appreciate. And speaking of that, we have a friendly letter from a young bride, Mrs. Dorothy Sherman of Los Angeles, who writes, Long before my marriage, I was a faithful user of Lux Flakes, not only for my nice things, but for dishes too. You can imagine how good it made me feel at dinner just the other night when my husband complimented me on my appearance and my smooth, soft hands. Those Lux Suds in the dishpan are a hint I honestly believe all brides should follow. Our thanks to Mrs. Sherman, and may Lux continue to help brighten a long, happy married life. On to our play, the first act of One More Tomorrow, starring Dennis Morgan as Tom Collier, Jane Wyman as Christy Sage, and Alexis Smith as Cecilia Henry. <laughs> It's September 1939. The fact that Germany invaded Poland just a few hours ago is in no way interfering with the surprise birthday party for Mr. Thomas Rufus Collier III. At the door of Mr. Collier's country home in Connecticut, Pat, the butler, ushers in two young women. What's up, ladies? Trying to crash a party? Now, take it easy, Shamrock. I'm Miss Sage, and this is Miss Connors. We're from Mayfair Life magazine. Hoity-toity. You're not the butler. Why ain't I the butler? Oh, you certainly don't sound like one. That's what makes me so attractive, baby. Look, we came here to take pictures. We're supposed to shoot the party. Shooting's too good for most of them. So I gather. It's murder in Poland, and we've got to come here to a Playboy surprise party. I don't take it so big, sister. Just snag a couple of drinks and make yourself at home. Thanks. But would you mind pointing us out, pointing him out to us, that Thomas Rufus Collier the third? It ain't polite to point, but that's him over there. Hey, Tom. Yeah? The girls want to take your picture. Why? The boss says why. Well, I've been asking myself the same question all the way from town. <laughs> They're okay, boss. Come on over. Let them take your picture. Well, take your pictures, my child. The house is yours. Her name is Miss Sage. Would you mind going to the doorway? Your friends have just surprised you, and I get a picture of you st and standing there completely astonished. Astonished, huh? How's this? Oh, that's fine. All America's waiting for this, Mr. Collier. Please don't disappoint them. Oh, I never do. How are the lights, Anne? All set. May I have the first dance with you, Miss Sage? You do dance. Your head, Mr. Collier. Higher, please. I suppose it's all right if I dislocate my neck, huh? It's all right with me. Well, come on now, look astonished. Here we go, Mr. Collier. That's it. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Oh, you're not going to stop with one. Well, we'll just browse around for a while, if that's all right. Oh, but I just can't let oh, you, uh... I thought you and I were going to have a quiet little talk. Were we, Father? Oh, Tom, be serious. There's a vacancy in the firm, and I thought that... Not again. Well, I thought you might like it as a birthday present. I've arranged... <coughs> well, what do you want? Him. Excuse me for button in, boss, but you should see what's sitting outside in the patio. Well? Your lawyer. But what a gorgeous tomato he brung with him. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yes, what's the matter with you, Pat? Can't you see my father and I are talking business? Huh? But if you let that tomato get away, you're fired. I'll be out in a couple of minutes. Uh, 
sure you don't want to go inside, Cecilia? Oh, it's much too nice out here on the patio. Thomas Rufus Collier III has a very attractive house. Yes, there's everything, Cecilia. Country home completely equipped. Bachelor available. Is that a fantastic butler part of the equipment? Oh, Pat? Oh, definitely. Tom discovered Pat in a bar in Brooklyn. He's been his man Friday for five years now. Tell me more about Tom. Well, no sense of responsibility and a little money. Enough for a life of leisure while it lasts. Well, his father's awfully rich. Money. The subject fascinates you, doesn't it? Completely. I just happen to like money. Lots and lots of money. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've lived on a shoestring ever since I was born, and I loathe shoestrings. And where exactly do I fit in? Oh, you know I'm fond of you, but well, as far as the future's concerned, well, I... Washed up covers it nicely, eh? Face it, Owen. A fine old family name and a pretty face are no good unless you do something about them. Oh, but why Tom Collier? You haven't even met him. Well... Why do you have him as a client? Tom will come into a fortune one of these days, and he won't know how to use it. That's where I come in. Oh, no, darling. That's where I come in. I don't suppose it would do any good to remind you that marriage has to do with other things besides spending money. Really? Tell me. Well, making a home, having children. For other people, perhaps. I believe you're the most selfish woman I've ever met. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. Now run inside and get me a drink. <sighs> yes, darling. With lots of ice to match that personality. Well, I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Collier. But what happened to Owen? He was going to get me a drink. Oh, I took care of Owen. He and my father are knee-deep in politics by now. <laughs> Say, why haven't I met you before? Well, perhaps it's because I've been south for a couple of years. Oh? Well, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? What's your favorite color? And uh, do you believe in dreams? You mean where have I been all your life? Hey, Pat, bring those drinks over here. I thought you might be getting thirsty. Pat, meet Miss Henry. Hi. How do you do? Hey, take a slug of this Manhattan, Miss Manhattan, Miss Henry. Here's yours, boss, and baby makes three. Well, happy birthday. 32. I feel ancient. 32? Oh, that's awfully young. You can't even be president till you're 35. I can't? Well, I guess I'll have to have all my fun the next three years then, huh? And I'll <laughs> help you. By the way, are you old enough to vote? Mm, with a few years to spare. Good. That makes your vote, mine and Pat's. I ought to do as well as Landon. <laughs> you know, boss, this is a terrible party. Not a single dame has given me the glad eye yet. What's the matter with your friends anyway? They're not my friends. They're my father's. Oh, what's the matter with your father's friends? How about you, baby? You like to dance? I love to. Do you dance well? Well, I, I ain't never won no See, clubs, but... you're still out there? This is our dance. I'll be right there, Owen. I'm terribly sorry, Pat, but I promised this one to Mr. Arthur. How about the next one? If I'm available. What's the matter with me, boss? Am I losing my fascination? I'd say we both are. Look who's leaving our party. Huh? In the driveway, Mayfair Magazine. Oh. Hey, hey, did you get enough pictures? Oh, plenty. Wait a second. You know, it's a waste of time taking pictures of useless people. Well, we have two million readers, Mr. Collier. Not all of them have your high standards. You girls are leaving much too early. Things really don't begin to happen around here until midnight. That's when I get sleepy. But somebody's sure to push somebody in the swimming pool. Well, by 12 o'clock, Poland may have started fighting. Then we'll have much more interesting pictures of death and destruction. I'm sorry. Look, uh, will you give me a ride into town? You're leaving the party? Why not? Oh, won't your guests think it's strange? It's a surprise party. I'll surprise them. It'll be a tight squeeze. It's just a coup. You make it sound very attractive. Move over, boss. You too. Oh, sure. You're staying here, Pat. I'll phone you in the morning. Oh, who's going to help me with all those dirty dishes? Boss! Hey! Hey, you can't do that! Cecilia? Alone? Again? What have you done with Tom? It seems he disappeared with two mad photographers. Mm, I'm afraid manners are not his strong point. They will be. Oh? When I marry him. And this is our apartment, Mr. Collier. Anne's and mine. Very cozy, indeed. And the gentleman sprawled on the sofa is Mr. James Fisk. He's Anne's boss. We've met before, haven't we, Mr. Fisk? No, I don't think so. I might have forgotten you, but you'd never have forgotten me. Strange, I could have sworn that... You uh... might have seen my picture somewhere. I used to be an advertising model. You were? Yes, I was the man with the dry scalp, pink toothbrush, or else my underwear wasn't happy with me. <laughs> now, wait a minute. 
It's also quite possible he saw your picture on the front page of Band of Magazine. Jim's the editor of Band of Magazine, Mr. Collier. Before that, he was my boss on Mare Fair Life. Bantam, do you read it? No, no, but I've, I've heard my father mention it. I hope the ladies left the room when he did. <laughs> he doesn't like you very much, Mr. Fisk. The Bantam is nothing more than a good American liberal magazine. I don't know what you mean by a liberal magazine. We mean a publication in which no one will advertise and which very few people read. It tells the absolute truth. It's controlled by no interest, and it's indebted to no one except the printer. Hence, as with most liberal magazines, Bantam is always flat on its back. Well, I've developed the negative, Mr. Collier. Here, Jim, what do you think of it? Very pretty. But what is it a picture of? Of me, Thomas Rufus Collier III, amply demonstrating why there should never be a fourth. Hello? Yes, he's here. Oh, Jim, it's for you. Can't you observe I'm reclining on your sofa? Bring it over here. The cord isn't long enough. Well, tell him to call back another time when I'm nearer the phone. Oh, come <laughs> on. Oh, this is ridiculous. Hello? What? Oh, yes, Herb. But they've been saying that ever since we first started owing them money. Well, tell him to come to the phone. You won't talk to me? All right, if I think of anything, I'll call you back. Well? The magazine should go to press tonight, but the Randall Press flatly refuses to print another issue until we pay them the money we owe. How much is it now? Oh, about $7,000. How much has the Bantam got in the bank? The bank didn't even trouble to send us a statement last month. Figure it out for yourself. Must be lots of fun publishing a magazine. Oh, yes, you can see. We're all practically in hysterics. Mr. Fisk, uh, how much money does the Bantam lose in a year? Oh, about 20000 Hmm, that's not much. Now, wait a minute. Now, if we worked very hard, I'm perfectly certain we could lose twice that amount. Why, I might even double my salary. Well, that's beginning to sound like I might be interested. Are you serious, Mr... What's his name? Collier. Collier? I think so. Now, wait a minute. If you're coming in on this just on a rich man's whim... This is not a rich man's whim. If the world's going to war, the least I can do is go to work. What do you know about the Bantam? Do you know what it stands for? All I know about the Bantam is that my father doesn't like it. And that's good enough for me. What we could do with some money, a bigger staff, a better makeup. We could even afford to hire you, Christy. Oh, that would have to be part of the deal. Miss Sage would have to go to work for us. Then we're all set. Now, have you got $7,000 in cash on you? I, uh, I left my money in my other suit. Then write a check to Randall Press. Just hand me a pen and ink. Ink? Use my blood. <laughs> and give me Mr. Collier's negative, Anne. Page one of our next issue. Meet the new publisher. Jim? Jim, where are you? I'm lying down on my couch. Now, what do you want, Anne? Here, layouts. Want to take a look at them? Right after my 12 o'clock nap. What's wrong with now, after your 11 o'clock nap? Look, me a good girl and Buzz, Tom, and Christy, we have a lot of important matters to talk about. You're the laziest liberal I've ever known. Besides, Tom isn't in his office. I just looked in. That was a mistake. Always try him first in Christy's office. Oh. Hello? Christy, is Tom with you? Want to talk to him? Jim wants to talk to both of you. Hustle over. It's a conference. How did you know Tom was with Christy, Jim? I majored in biology. Shall I tell you what I think? Oh, no. Please don't. I think those two are in love. Such things happen. They've seen enough of each other these past months. Hello, everybody. And what does our horizontal editor wish? Who wrote that editorial on the Bund meeting in Madison Square Garden? Well, uh, well, I did. Why? Oh, nothing. It just reads good enough to be me. Thank you. I knew one day you'd make me sit up and take notice. The day when you just sit up, I want to be here with a camera. <laughs> I think clearest in a prone position. Well, children, we have an important decision to make. The Williams and Warren Advertising Agency, on behalf of their client, Albany Copper, wish to purchase our back page for six months. Oh? Well, what's the matter with that? We have a back page, don't we? Well, the trouble, Tom, is that once you've taken that sort of advertising, you don't really own your own magazine anymore. We'll find ourselves making concessions, soft peddling, listening to reason. You mean that we won't be able to print what we want to print? We won't be able to insult the people we want to insult? Not with Albany Copper on the back page. Then we'll tell Albany Copper to go jump in the lake. I'm glad you feel that way, Tom, because I've already written them a letter telling them to do just that. But not quite so politely. I shall have to deliver it in person, though. It'd never get through the mails. 
Anne, my love, you'd better help push me into a taxi cab. The trouble with you is you're bedridden. The trouble with you is you're in love with me. Maybe that's the reason I don't ask you for a raise. Come on, old man, this way. Christy, what goes on there? Do you think Jim and Anne are in love? Of course they are. Then why don't they get married? Well, the thought just hasn't occurred to both of them at the same time. But it will someday. Tom, I'm very proud of you. Why? What have I done now? Albany Copper. Oh, I have principles now. Lots of them. Well, if I have, it's your doing. You took me over, remember? <laughs> I think I did a good job. Christy, what would you say if I kissed you? Well, I, I'd say, uh, why, Mr. Collier, during business hours? It's lunchtime. Oh, well, that's different then. As long as it's lunchtime, I'll kiss you. Lunch at Hayden's and champagne for lunch? My, oh, my. I told you this was an occasion. What occasion? I have plans to discuss with you, Miss Sage. It's about a partnership. My father says a partnership is the worst kind of a ship to sail in. But I don't agree with it. Most solid businessmen advise incorporating because they can't trust the other fellows. But in this case, I feel I could trust the other fellow completely. Here, uh, try this wine. It's terrific. You were saying, Mr. Collier. Christy, look. I, I don't know how you're going to take this, but you can keep your apartment in town. On weekends, we'll drive up to Connecticut. I know it didn't impress you the first time, but it wouldn't have to be cluttered up with the usual crowd. We could have our own gang and a special soapbox for Jim. Well, how does it strike you? Christy, I'm trying to ask you to marry me. I guess I knew you'd ask me sooner or later. Clever, Christy. Oh, Tom, I... I don't know what to say. Say yes, and I'll get back my appetite. Oh, look, we're good friends, the best in the world, but I wouldn't fit into your life at all. That's nonsense. You'd fit in anywhere. Tom, I don't like your pre bantam friends, and I know they wouldn't like me. I don't like them either. But they're part of your life, whether you're willing to admit it or not. But what about Please it? let me finish. I've worked so hard all my life that I've had no patience with people who didn't. I know myself pretty well. I'd be bored stiff with a lot of money. Oh, come now. Money's not so bad. Well, you see, you take it for granted. I couldn't. But you could go on working if that's what you wanted. But I wouldn't want to work if I were married. I'd want a home, a real one, raise a family. Well, that's just fine. Oh, no, Tom. No, it wouldn't work. Christy, all this analyzing, it isn't getting us anywhere. You're thinking too much. Let yourself feel for a change. Tom, I believe in marriage. So much so, I want to give it everything I've got when the time comes. I don't think a person ought to get married unless it's all important. I mean, when you think of the person, you're breathless, never any doubt, an all-out feeling. Are you trying to tell me you don't love me? Oh, I'd know if I loved you. Is that final? Well, then, I guess there's nothing more to say. It kind of spoils things. You mean the bantam? Yeah. Well, don't worry about that. I, I'm resigning anyway. Christy. No, look. I've worked a long time for other people, and now I want to work for myself. I want to get away and find a new approach. I thought about going down to Mexico. Wish me luck, Tom. Christy. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Desperately sorry. Sure. Come on, let's get out of here. Stars Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, and Alexis Smith will return in a moment with Act Two of One More Tomorrow. What's this about a new use for an unfinished house, Libby? Why, it makes a wonderful place to dance. That is, if you're as clever as Gene Kelly. In Metro Gold Mayer's new picture, Living in a Big Way, he does the most sensational dance of his career, right over the roof, walls, and framework of a half built house. Even the tools take part. Well, if I were building a house, I'd like to have Marie McDonald inside it. <laughs> oh, she makes a wonderful dance partner for Jean in the picture. And she's very lovely to look at, too. With Charles Winninger and Spring Byington for her screen parents, you can imagine there's plenty of fun. And more fun whenever Clinton Sundberg comes in camera range. Well, everybody would be living in a big way, just like the picture's title, if real life were packed so full of comedy, romance, songs, and dancing. And beautiful clothes. Oh, yes. Marie McDonald's costumes are absolutely out of this world. 
They stay that way, too, through strenuous dance routines because they get such perfect care. Meaning Lux Flakes? Yes. I was surprised at how many of the gorgeous dance co costumes were luxed to help keep them in first-class condition for the picture. Though, after all, the studio's rule is the same one smart girls everywhere follow. If it's safe in water, it's safe in Lux. Colors do stay lovely longer with Lux Care. That's been proved. You remember, Libby, that a famous laboratory washed scores of different fabrics. When they checked the results, they found that those washed the Lux way stayed color fresh up to three times as long as those washed the wrong way. That means a lot to a girl on a budget. She can Lux everything from play clothes to pretty afternoon dresses for ever so little, yet keep them fresh and gay much longer. That's true, Libby. I've seen summer cottons and printed rayons luxed as many as 20 times. And they still had that nice as new look, that Lux look. Now back to your producer, William Keeley. We continue with the second act of One More Tomorrow, starring Dennis Morgan as Tom Collier, Jane Wyman as Christy, and Alexis Smith as Cecilia. <laughs> It was a hard jolt to take, Christie's refusal to marry him, but Tom Collier has remained with Bantam Magazine. And with Christie away in Mexico, he's been discovering how attractive other girls can be. One in particular, Miss Cecilia Henry. One night after the theater in Cecilia's apartment... It's late, Tom. Are you staying in town or driving back to Connecticut? Oh, I'll drive. This time of night I can make it in one hour and one traffic ticket. Oh, Tom, please do drive carefully. You're worrying about me. That's good. Is it? <laughs> I'm glad the maid started the fireplace. Feels good, doesn't it? Firelight does things to you, see. What does it do? You know very well what it does. You're lovely. Well, I, I don't feel lovely. I have a terrible headache. Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes if I rub the back of my neck... Say, how are you at rubbing the back of a girl's neck? Inexperienced, but willing. How, uh... How's this? Oh, more gently, Tom. There. That's better. Oh? <laughs> Is that part of the treatment, kissing my ear? There's a slight extra charge. But well worth it. It's uh, silly to kiss a girl's ear when... When, uh... if she'd just turn her head like this. Darling. Tom, it's... It's almost three o'clock. Did you just kiss me with one eye on the clock? But it is late, dear. I don't ever want to go see. See, I've been thinking, when I marry, if, uh, if you were to marry me... Tom, I'd do anything to make you happy. You mean you will marry me? <laughs> of course. See, that, that's wonderful. We live in the country, darling. We'll have lots of children. We'll even have... Children? A... You want children, don't you? Oh, of course, darling, but... But just for a little while, I want only you. Tom, what will your father say? Will he approve of me? Approve? Darling, you're the one subject we never argue about. Mrs. Collier. Mrs. Thomas Rufus Collier III. Well, say something, Pat. I told you I was going to get married. Well, look, boss, if you want to get married, get married. What, uh, what do you have to ask my permission for? Forget it. No, wait. You, uh, you happy about getting married? Sure. Is Miss Henry happy about getting married? I hope so. Is your old man for it? Hook, line, and checkbook. So even if I vetoed it, you could still raise a necessary two-thirds vote. You just haven't met the right girl, Pat. Boys, I meet the right girl on the average of twice a week. No, oh, no. It's just a guy gets married, he's, he's tied down. One day he turns around, he's 50. Even if you're not married, you turn around one day and you're 50. Boys, I ain't winning this argument. It's, uh, it's not that you don't like Cecilia, is it? Well, no, no. She's a swell looker and, uh... But what? Well, well, it ain't a big but what, but, uh, you think she's a little, uh... Well, would cold be the word? All women with her classic type of beauty are a little reserved. Yeah. Yeah, well, give me a little less looks and a lot more Fahrenheit. <laughs> you, uh, you've got to admit she's awfully smart. Boy, she's a whole lot smarter than you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, that's what I mean. You laugh right out loud. <laughs> she gives out with a polite smile, all teeth and no tonsils. <laughs> well, when's the wedding, boss, and where? Right here, Pat. June the 1st. I'm 
sure glad we don't throw a wedding here every week, boss. The guests all gone? Me and your old man just rolled the last of them out the front door. Well, I'll start cleaning up the joint. What a character. <laughs> yes. You really married me, haven't you, see? For good and always. Heaven make this one good. You see, I, uh, I haven't much confidence in marriage. I was exposed to a very bad case as a baby. We'll make this one good. Oh, Tom, it was such a wonderful wedding. And I'm so glad your friends from the Bantam were able to come. Tom, wasn't there another girl from the magazine? Christy? Who? Uh, Miss Sage. She's, uh, she's in Mexico, I think. Oh. Well, well, should we... Well, here you are. Hello, Father. Tom, marrying Cecilia is the only smart thing you've ever done. Being born your son wasn't such bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have a little present for you. Here, a check. Oh, well, I didn't know there was this much money in the world. <laughs> in Father's world, there is. It's very generous, Dad. What are the strings? <laughs> well, I, I don't expect you to throw it away on that crazy magazine, if that's what you mean. That's what I thought. But I have no objection to the publishing field. Matter of fact, I made a few inquiries. Wilder and Higgins might be persuaded to sell a half interest in their outfit. I'm sorry, Dad. I'll stick with the Bantam. Oh, the Bantam. Nobody reads it. Nobody ever will. You'll ruin yourself supporting it. That's a risk I'll have to take. Thanks anyway, Dad, but we won't need the check. Why, Tom? I'll, uh, I'll see you in the house, darling. Ungrateful young fool. Don't be upset, Father. He'll find himself one day. Cecilia, if there's any hope for Tom, you're it. From now on, I leave everything in your hands. Including the check? <laughs> Including the check. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you and I should have been in business together. Well, we are in a way, aren't we? Who was that at the door, dear? Just a telegram. Nothing important. Telegram? Who from? Really, see, it's, it's nothing. Are you going to start our marriage out with a deception? <laughs> These discerning women. It's from Christy. Here, read it. Arriving from Mexico this evening, she wants you to meet her. Well, why don't you, dear? The night we're back from our honeymoon? Certainly not. Oh, really, darling, I don't mind. She has to find out about us, and it would be nicer to hear it from you. See, you mean that? Of course I mean it. You're unusually charitable for a woman. I like that. Thank you. She would think it strange if I didn't meet her. We were good friends, see? Yes, I know you were. Now go and meet her, darling. Run along. Thanks for bringing me here, Tom. Why did you want to come to Hayden? Oh, because it was here we once said goodbye. You, uh, you haven't told me a thing about Mexico. Oh, you'd love it, Tom. Sometimes at night in the sleepy little towns you hear a man singing far away. And beyond your balcony the stars are whiter than any stars ever were. You've changed. Analytical Christie talking about stars and balconies. I remember the last time we were here. Oh, Tom, Tom, I was so wrong. I wanted so badly to tell you. I did love you, only I didn't know it. Why didn't you sock me for being so stupid? Why didn't you, darling? It would have saved us so much time. Christy. Tom, I love you so much. From the very moment I began to miss you, I... Christy. I've just been married. Who is she? Cecilia Henry. Oh. Tall, blonde, and beautiful. Does she love you? I think so. Clever, Christy. Knew all the answers. <laughs> Clumsy, Christy. The boss is just coming up the drive, missus. We'll have cocktails in the patio. Bring the mail out first. Wait till he gets a load of them bills. You open my husband's mail again. Oh, you don't mind. I always used to. What you used to do five months ago is no concern of mine, but what you do now is. Okay. And when you come back, please see that you're wearing your white jacket. And our circulation's going up, see? A thousand new subscriptions last month. Not bad for the Bantam, huh? Sit down, darling. You must be tired. Boys, Pat. I'm mixing you a martini. Tom... Tom, I hate to say this, but, well, really, we've got to get rid of him. See. Si. Well, when you lived here alone, it didn't matter. Perhaps Pat fit it in. But, well, uh, are we being fair to him, depriving him of a chance to make something of himself? Pat belongs to that blessed band of humans who don't want to make something of themselves. It's a great talent if you have it. 
Darling, please. I think we'd all be happier. I won't be happier. Pat and I understand each other, see? <laughs> I'm awfully fond of that guy. You're awfully fond of me, and we understand each other, too. Do we? Tom! I'm sorry, darling. I'll tell him. Thank you. Oh, uh, this came this afternoon, this invitation. Henri Picard Gallery. Oh, an exhibition of photographs by Miss Christine Sage. To be held... But it's... It's tonight. <laughs> Strange they should have sent an invitation at the last minute. See, would you mind very much going? If... If I only felt better, dear. I, I haven't been feeling very well lately. See, you're, you're not keeping anything from me. Tom, you know I'm not. I thought you're not feeling well, Are my... you going to start talking about the patter of little feet? Don't joke about it, see? After all, why not? There's plenty of money. You wouldn't be tied down. Let's not talk about it now. If you really want to go to Miss Sage's exhibition, I'll, I'll have to change. See, wait. You meant what you said that night, didn't you? About wanting to have a family and really make something of our marriage? Of course I did. Darling, please don't be angry with me. You were... Uh... You better go upstairs and get dressed, dear. You won't forget to tell Pat. No. Well, I'll tell him right now. It's uh, funny you want to talk to me, boss, and can I be wanting to talk to you? Pat, I, uh, I've been thinking. You know, there's not much future in butling. Oh, well, uh, you have no idea how grateful I am for everything you've done. Hey, take it easy, will you? No, no, I, I really mean it. I... You think I'm a great guy, huh? The tops. You would have to say that at a time like this. Just when... When when what? Well, I... Oh, forget it. You're not in trouble, are you? Me? What trouble? Pat, what I've you got to listen to me. And, and don't hold it against me, but I, I'm quitting you. I, I took another job. You what? I know what you're going to say. Holy cats. Well, I, I just couldn't stand it any longer. And well, she don't like my ways. I, I mean the missus. So I'm going in with Moe Winters. He's opening up a gym here in the country, and he asked me what I run it for. I'm like Muldoon's, only with a small bar attached. And Well, well so help me, I, I give him my word. When does he want you to start? Well, now, boss, right away, but... Then pack your bag. You're leaving tonight. You mean it's okay? You won't be sorry? You, you mean you... I'm overjoyed for you. Oh, take it from me, boss. You're the goods. And me running away from you like a rat. Cut it out, Pat. Get going, will you? And you, uh... Better leave that shaker. I, I think I could use a drink. He's gone, see? Pat's gone. Thank you, darling. I know it's for the best. Hey, didn't you come up here to get dressed? Well, I, I'm really not up to a Tom in exhibition. Besides, it would be better if you went alone. But see, I thought... Run along, darling, or you'll be late. Won't you change your mind? No, dear. And don't worry about me. I have a treat in store for myself. Treat? The luxury of missing you. See, I'm not going either. But darling... No. Oh, but you wanted to, and, and Miss Sage, she'll be disappointed. I... I, I'll send her a telegram. I look at you, see, and wonder what sort of a fool I am ever to think of leaving you. Tom, you're so very sweet. You're beautiful, see. I've never seen you look so beautiful. Just a minute. Hello, Christy. Good morning. Oh, Tom, what are you doing here? I just stopped by on my way to the office. Well, you're very early. Yes. Well, Anne hasn't left yet. I'll, I'll tell her you're here. You can give her a lift. Christy, I want to speak to you alone. Your exhibition last night, I read the morning papers. I, I've got them all here in case you missed any. At least the critics are unanimous in their opinions. The greatest flop that ever hit an art gallery. They weren't fair. No, I don't think so, but... How do you know you weren't there? No, I... I thought maybe you'd be needing a friend. Don't let the critics get you down, Christy. Oh, but I'm not down, Tom. I've got all sorts of commercial assignments, and besides, Jim Fisk called me and wants me to write a series of articles for the Bantam. Yes, he, uh, he mentioned that. So, I'm on top of the world. Let's skip it, then. Oh, no, Tom, don't soften. Be tough so I can take it. Not tough, honest. You taught me to be honest, remember? All right, be honest. You have a great talent, Christy. Thank you. How do you want me to use that talent? Well, 
I'd use it to... to... Look, let's have lunch and talk it over. No, Tom. I've missed you, Christy. Haven't you missed me? Well, you see, it's this way. I... Oh, of course I've missed you. We need each other, Christy. No, no, Tom, it won't do. Why can't we see each other once in a while? Christy, please. All right, on one condition. Always out in the open where everybody can see. Why should a friendship be hidden? What's there to hide? Well, things get misunderstood. Not this. One o'clock for lunch at Hayden's? I'll be there. Thanks, Christy. Everything all right, Christy? I, I recognize your voice. Couldn't be worse. Oh, poor kid. No, I, I'm glad, but I, I can't see him again. Yeah, that's wise. No mess. We, we couldn't have that. Hey, now, take it easy. He, he said he'd give you a lift to the office. He'll come back for you now. And if I see him again, I'll die. He loves you, Christy. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think he knows himself. Oh, Anne, did you see the way he looks? Curly hair and that same crooked smile. Now, stop it. He'll always look like that, even when he's old. And the funny way he stands with his feet sort of... Duck-footed? Oh, no, not at all. It's a perfectly natural way to stand. Hey, hey, I <laughs> forgot Anne. Let's make it 12.30, Christy. 12.30 at Hayden. This way, Mr. Collier. I have your table all ready, sir. Thanks. Hello, Tom. Anne, I thought I left you and Jim hard at work. Christy phoned me a little while ago. I, I met her in front of the office. Well, where is she? She's not coming, Tom. She asked me to meet you here. Now, wait a minute. Tom, I know this is none of my business, but well, I can't bear to see Christy the way she is. I want the old Christy back again like she was before. Before she met me? Yes. Last night at the exhibition. All evening long, she was watching the door, waiting for you to come in. <laughs> That's the trouble when you carry a torch, Tom. You wind up with cinders in your eye. Last night, Last I... Last night doesn't matter. Christy knows now that she's got to stop yearning for something that can never be. And you know it, too. Do I? If you love her, Tom, leave well enough alone. Did Christy ask you to tell me this? She only asked me to tell you one thing. Goodbye. But how can I... Thanks. Thanks, Anne. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll bring you Act Three of One More Tomorrow, starring Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, and Alexis Smith in a moment. A good actress tries to live her role, but not many go so far as Maria Palmer, our lovely young guest tonight. When Enterprise cast her in the role of a nurse in the David Lewis production, The Other Love, she immediately enrolled in a nurse's training class at a Los Angeles hospital, so she could do a realistic job before the camera. Maria, I understand you made your first picture in Vienna at the ripe old age of four. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Keeley, and I made my stage debut at the ripe old age of eight. <laughs> and how do you like working in Hollywood now? Oh, I love it. My most interesting experience here has been working with Barbara Stanwyck, David Niven, and Richard Conte in The Other Love. A very intriguing love triangle. Oh, and Barbara Stanwyck is so lovely. Even though she plays the part of a convalescent in the picture... She wears the most beautiful gowns, perfectly gorgeous nightgowns and negligees. So playing ill had its compensations for Barbara. Oh, yes. And her lovely things weren't too extravagant either. Mr. Kennedy will be glad to hear that the studio luxed even the most delicate ones. And they looked wonderful at the end of the shooting. Oh, that's a helpful hint for every girl, Miss Palmer. With Lux Care, lovely lingerie isn't extravagant. That I know, Mr. Kennedy, because Lux keeps things lovely so long. Yes, actually three times as long. An independent laboratory proved that. They washed identical slips and nighties two different ways. Strong suds, hot water, and rough handling soon faded colors, left lingerie old-looking, shabby. 
But under things washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. And that's a help to any girl. Right you are, Miss Palmer, because when under things get gentle Lux care, girls find they can afford three times as many undies. They can buy extra ones instead of just replacing drab faded ones. Just one more reason why Lux is thrifty. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss Maria Palmer. We'll be seeing you again on the screen. Now, here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Our curtain rises on the third act of One More Tomorrow, starring Dennis Morgan as Tom, Jane Wyman as Christy, and Alexis Smith as Celia. For a month now, Tom has been in sort of a daze. He's deserted the Bantam, spent a couple of weeks in Quebec with Cecilia, but now on a bright winter's morning, he's wandered rather aimlessly back to the offices of the magazine. Well, how do you do, Mr. Collier? Darn nice of you to show up. Thanks, Jim. How's everything? Fine. Business is much better since you're not behind your desk every day. <laughs> Where is everybody? Christie's out of town, if that's what you mean. Yes, that's what I mean. And how's your wife, Mrs. Collier III? Do you really care? No Anglo-Saxon really cares. Well, I think I'll take the afternoon off. Uh, just a moment. I have a little matter to discuss. Can it wait? I'll be back again next month. Here on my desk is a series of articles about a certain company. This company has an army contract. The articles prove they've been delivering defective wiring to the Air Corps. Is that so serious? My dear boy, the wiring goes into airplanes. Yes, I think it's serious enough to cause a congressional investigation, which might send a few people to jail. Well, what's the hitch? Go ahead and publish the articles. One hitch is that the company in question is Albany Copper, an outfit festering with your friends. It means your friends would go to jail. Oh, it isn't exactly nice to send your friends to jail. They're not exactly nice people. Confound it, they ought to go to jail. I think so. Well, go ahead and publish the articles. You're sure now? be a lot of pressure on you, you know. Hello. Yes, yes, he's here. Just a moment. It started already. Papa's on the line. Oh. Hello? Yes, Father? What? Yes, I think so. Lunch will be fine. I'll meet you at your club in an hour. No, to be perfectly frank, Tom, I, uh, I wanted to see you about that series of articles your magazine is considering. They're founded on a pack of lies, my boy. They're not, and you know it. I know nothing of the sort. Oh, someone at Albany Copper might have made a minor mistake. But I they... know these men, Dad. They never made a minor mistake in their lives. Tom, they're our friends. I grew up with most of them. You grew up with their sons. Excuse me, Mr. Collier. Telephone, sir. Oh, give it to me. Oh, how would anyone know I was here? Hello. Yes? Oh, uh, well, uh, how are you? Uh, uh, no, no, not quite yet. Uh, but I've no doubt this, uh, this advertising firm will see the light. Fine, fine. I'll call you tomorrow and confirm it. <laughs> yes, goodbye. Now, look, Tom, I don't really have to remind you of the things our sort of people do and the things we definitely do not do. Perhaps you'd better remind me. Well, for one thing, we don't deliberately try to ruin our best friends. Who do those men at Albany Copper think they are, Dad? Is a profit more important than a life? What makes them think they're beyond punishment? Now, Another Tom... Another phone call, sir. This time it's for young Mr. Collier. Now, uh, how would anyone know I was here? Hello? Oh, yes, Jim. No, don't worry about it. It's not as tough as I thought it was going to be. No, I guess I'll run on back to Connecticut. I'll see you tomorrow. Right. You were saying, Father? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Dear, I specifically told the new cook you wanted three-minute eggs, Tom, and just look at these. She's as bad as the new butler. Why don't you fire them both? <laughs> don't be silly with three defense plans around here. Oh, and I, I so wanted this to be an especially nice breakfast. Why? Well, a favor to ask. Tom, those articles in that silly magazine of yours... Now, look, Father's spoken to me a half a dozen times. His friends, my friends, people who've bounced me on their knees, they've all spoken to me. But I'm your wife. Above all others, you should listen to me. And, well, I'm going to have to tell you something. I promised your father I wouldn't. There's nothing else I can do. Tom, if Bantam Magazine publishes those articles, your father goes to jail with the others. What's Dad got to do with it? He runs Albany Copper. Yes, I know it isn't generally known, interlocking directorates, dummy vice presidents and all that. 
But the point is, if the rest are guilty, he's guilty too. Why didn't Dad tell me this? Well, be because he's a gentleman. He's willing to take what's coming to him rather than let you sacrifice one of those so-called principles of yours. Are you sure, C? Absolutely sure? He made me swear I wouldn't tell. But then, I haven't any principles. I, uh, I'd better get downtown right away. Oh, incidentally, dear, try to get home early. We're entertaining, you know. Hmm? Oh. Oh, sure. Yes? Oh. Oh. Why, you're Christine Sage, aren't you? Good afternoon, Mrs. Collier. Won't you come in? Thank you. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but I've been on the phone. My cook and butler suddenly decided to quit. I've been trying frantically. Well, I won't take up much of your time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Tom isn't home. Tom's in his office, Mrs. Collier. We've had to make a lot of last-minute changes in the next issue of the Bantam. A series of articles was suddenly canceled this morning. Oh. Well... Do sit down, Miss Sage. You know, I, I feel I know you quite well. Tom has spoken of you so often. Really? So much so that sometimes I've had a twinge of jealousy. <laughs> so stupid of me. You're wondering why I'm here. Well, I'll admit I'm a little curious. I wanted to talk to you about the Albany Copper articles. Oh, well, I thought you just said that was all settled. In a way, yes. But not a very nice way. Why did you lie to your husband? Really, Miss Sage? Why did you tell him his father would go to jail? Because it's true. I wrote those articles. I made a very thorough investigation. Tom's father owns a lot of shares, yes, but he couldn't possibly have been aware of what was going on. I know my facts. And I know my husband and what's best for him. I had to stop this reforming the world complex you people have imposed on him. And you didn't think a lie or two mattered as long as you got what you wanted. Exactly. Now, suppose you tell me what you want, Miss Sage. I want you to tell Tom the truth. And if I refuse? Tom is the publisher of Bantam Magazine. It's up to him whether or not those articles are printed. And if they're not printed, he'll lose everything. <laughs> lose everything? Yes. All that he's built up this past year will be gone. He won't be able to trust himself because when you publish a magazine like the Bantam, above all things, you must keep your integrity. You must do what you know is right. In this case, it's for me to decide what's right for Tom. It's a wife's privilege, you know. The right wife, yes. You're very outspoken. I'm sorry, but... No, no, really, I like it. I think I am the right wife for Tom, and this phase will pass, and he'll take his rightful place in the scheme of things. Whose scheme? Mine, no one else's. <laughs> Certainly not yours. Oh, you've got me all wrong, Mrs. Collier. I confess I love Tom. I know now that I've always loved him. But when he asked me to marry him... Tom I... asked you? Yes, I thought you knew. Are you trying to tell me that you refused to marry Tom Collier? Unfortunately, yes. I've often wondered what sort of a woman you were. Now I know. But I am glad you came down here this afternoon. Well, I'm sorry I came. I've wasted my time. You know, it's a shame. I've seen what having a job of work has done for Tom. But I can also see that you're not interested. You shut the door against honor or integrity or anything worthwhile because you know that one ray of decency led into your marriage would wreck it. I've been very patient with you, Miss Sage, but now you're going to listen hey, to me. Home? You were saying, Mrs. Uh, Collier? Nothing. Cecilia? That isn't Tom. No, that happens to be his father. Well, I won't embarrass you. I can leave through the patio. Goodbye, Mrs. Collier. Father? In here, dear. Oh, hello, C. Say, wasn't that that uh, photographer woman just leaving? We were just clearing up a little unfinished business. Oh, well, now suppose we do the same. Let's have our little talk before Tom gets home. I'm ready, Father. Let's go into the library. Boss! Hi, you boss! Pat! What are you doing here and in that monkey suit? Well, if you don't mind coming in the kitchen door, I'll tell you. It saves your cook and butler walked out. Since your missus is throwing a party tonight, she swallows her pride, makes a hurried call, and here's me. I never expected to see you here again. Now, there's a couple of your friends I neglected to spill soup on. <laughs> I figure tonight's my last chance. We got cream of mushroom. Boy, that really stains. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, boss, your, uh, your old man just left. Oh? Yeah, now he and your missus have been having quite a talk. Tell me something, boss. 
If a gentleman was walking by the door and he happened to hear two people talking about a friend of his, would he uh, listen? No, of course not. Well, if he did, would a gentleman go to this friend and tell him what he heard on the eavesdroop? Certainly not. Well, thank goodness I ain't a gentleman. <laughs> Pull up a chair, boss. You are about to get an earful. Well, good night, Z. Had a lovely time. Good night, Henry. I brought your car up the driveway, Mr. Pickering. Thank you. I can't tell you how sorry I am about your dinner jacket. Oh, nothing at all. Just a little soup stain. Ain't I the Butterfingers? Tom, dear, are you tired? No. Do I look tired? Well, you look something. Did the party bore you? I thought it was a grand success, except for Henry's dinner jacket. Yeah, I thought it kind of relieved the monotony myself. <laughs> you can turn out the lights, Pat. Good night. Okay, Mrs. Good night, boss. Good night, champ. You coming up, dear? See, I want to have a little talk with you. Why, of course, darling. What about? First of all, I'm going to print those articles. Your what? I'm going to expose the Albany copper scandal. Oh, uh, you're, you're talking nonsense. No, see, for the first time in months, I'm talking good common sense. Oh, but I told you your father would... Get... I know what you told me. I know the lie you told me. Lie? I know all about that little plan of yours and Dad's. You'd believe Christine Sage before you... Christy? What does she know about it? Pat told me. Well, suppose you do know. Don't you see father's doing it for you? All his life he's tried to help you, to do things for you. In order to own me. I don't know what to say to you. You're so unreasonable. If... Well, if only I didn't have this foul headache. You don't have a headache. You've played this little game too often. Same firelight, same headache. But this time now I... Now you're merely being rude. See? You know I've tried to make a go of this marriage. I may be old-fashioned, but I want a home. A real home and a family. I don't want to talk about that. But I do. Very well, then. You may as well know. I don't want children, and I never have. So that was a lie, too. I could have forgiven your disloyalty to me about father. I could even forgive some of your petty deceits. But I don't want any part of a marriage that's founded on a lie. Stop prattling about honor and loyalty. You married me for exactly the same reasons I married you, because I attracted you, because you thought I'd be an asset to you. Well, you got just that. I haven't changed. And all this business about having children is your way of putting the blame on me because the marriage hasn't worked. Well, I'm fed to the teeth with a good night. Well, uh... I'm going now, boss. So long. Where are you going, Pat? Station. Just time enough to make the milk train. I'll drive you. Oh, I, it ain't far. I can walk. No, I, I'm leaving, too. I'm going back to my wife, Pat. Oh, ain't you going in the wrong direction? Your wife's upstairs. I mean my real wife. <laughs> Christy, Christy, over here. Tom, Tom, I came as fast as I could. Oh, Anne phoned me that you were here. Here we are meeting at Hayden's again. You scared of jinxes? Oh, no, Tom, no. Good. She's getting what she wanted, Christy, my shirt. Oh, don't worry, Tom, we still have the bantam. That little fellow's going to have to support me from now on. He will. Well, I've had a busy morning. I've sent my friends to jail, my wife to Reno. What are you doing this afternoon and this evening? Well, I don't know. But one thing I'm sure of, darling, this time I'm not going to Mexico. Before our stars return for their curtain calls, Sally and I have a story for you. It's called, Where There's a Wool, There's a Way, or Leave It to Lux. It's a continued story, because when you give your blankets Lux care, they continue to stay soft and fluffy longer. And it's an escape story, because with gentle Lux care, you escape things that are particularly hard on wool blankets. There's no need for hot water or strong soap. None of that rough handling that's so apt to shrink and roughen the soft wool fibers. It's a story that needs to be told right now, too, when you're getting ready to put most of your blankets away for the summer. You know how wonderful Lux is for baby woolens, your own sweaters, and your husband's wool socks. Well, it's just as wonderful for wool blankets. And they stay lovely, last longer when you Lux them. 
Besides, moths don't like clean blankets. But Sally, let's get right down to the facts of our story. How to wash a blanket. Chapter one. If the binding is badly soiled, brush it lightly first with Lux Suds. Then make ex extra rich Lux Warm Lux Suds about four inches thick in your tub or washer. Wash gently by hand without rubbing or run your machine three minutes. Chapter two. Rinse several times in water the same lukewarm temperature by hand or run the machine two minutes for each rinse. Don't wring or twist. Chapter three. Hang it out of doors over two or three parallel lines. Be sure to pick a sunny day with a light breeze. From time to time, shake the blanket gently to help fluff the nap. When it's dry, press the binding only. So there's our story. A success story that really begins when you buy a box of Lux Flakes and leave it to Lux to care for your blankets. Back now to William Keeley. You've heard from Lux Flakes. Now let's hear from our three stars, Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, and Alexis Smith. You know, this is something of an occasion for you three. Being on Lux is. How else do you mean, Bill? Well, Alexis here has just finished celebrating her birthday. <laughs> if a woman can ever really celebrate a birthday. <laughs> And you and Jane are opening here in your latest Warner Brothers picture, Cheyenne. Well, thanks for the plug, Bill. And Dennis's fans are going to love him in that picture. He's so brave and so rugged. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who wouldn't be brave wearing a brace of young horse pistols? Just what are young horse pistols? Colts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand you went to Cheyenne for the premiere of that picture, Dennis. That's right, Bill. Almost didn't get back. What happened, Denny? Well, they don't know when winter's over in Wyoming. We almost got snowed in. Snow? The end of May? Six inches. How do you account for that? Well, that's too deep for me. <laughs> but when the weather's right, that's wonderful fishing country, Dennis. Don't I know it. Those mountain streams are jammed with trout. You sound as if you're speaking from experience. Sure. I'm the guy that left them there. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis here has just returned from a trip, too, down through Mexico. Have any fun, Alexis? Well, I was so tired when I got back, I must have. <laughs> but I'm glad we got you all back for tonight's performance. And incidentally, we have another great treat for our audience next week. What's it going to be, Bill? One of the season's most promising screen hits with a brilliant cast. It's David Lewis's enterprise production of The Other Love, starring Barbara Stanwyck, George Brent, and that sensational new star, Richard Conte. A great cast and a great play, Bill. Yes, it's the sensitive and sympathetic story of a woman fighting for her life and two men fighting for her love. A strange, dramatic triangle that builds to a deeply moving climax. Sounds like a wonderful evening to look forward to. Good night, Bill. Good night, and Good night. I see your thanks. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Lakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck, George Brent, and Richard Conte in The Other Love. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Here's a way to help bring down your food budget. Just save every drop of used fat in your kitchen. Turn it in regularly to your dealer. He'll give you cash for it. In fact, more than dealers paid last year for used fat. Use that money to cut your meat or grocery bill. America is still seriously short of fats and oils for soaps and other things you want. So keep right on saving all the used fat you can. Alexis Smith is currently being seen in Warner Brothers' production of The Two Mrs. Carrolls. Heard in our cast tonight were Gail Gordon as Jim Fisk, Ira Grossell as Pat, Francis Robinson as Anne, and Bill Johnstone as Rufus Collier, with Stanley Waxman and Charles Seal. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Other Love with Barbara Stanwyck, George Brent, and Richard Conte. And why not tune in to Joan Davis every Monday night over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.